Now, when I way back before I came to graduate school, in my first professional uh, position uh, as a recent graduate, one of the first things I learned was something that I was told was the two-year rule. Now, the two-year rule states that a water-related catastrophe, like a flood or a drought, opens a two-year window for action and change. If we don't get something done in two years, we lose interest, urgency declines, and we have to wait for the next disaster uh, if we're going to make change. Uh, so uh, to get us started in that spirit, I thought I, we would take a quick look at this year's water content in the Sierra snowpack. Uh, so on the plots here, the, northern, the top one is for the northern Sierra, the bottom one is for the southern Sierra. The shaded turquoise color shows the average over the historical record, and it's scaled to the average on April 1st. So we can see how the snowpack tends to develop on average over the winter uh, and early summer season. The green line is the snowiest year in the record, 82-83. Uh, the red line is the least snowy year in the historical record, which was 76, 77. Uh, what is of interest to us is that the brown and purple are the last two years and the blue is this year. There is essentially almost no snow in the Sierras. I would argue this opens a window uh, for the two-year rule uh, and I want to think about how we might tackle that. Now, the way I would like to do that is to think about one particular problem, which is the problem of the value we obtain from the water we take out of the environment. When we take water out of the environment, there are high costs. Uh, Rosemary illustrated one of those high costs in land subsidence. Uh, the way to think about the problem is to think about two things. Are there ways of reducing the amount we take out of the environment, and are there ways of getting more value uh, for the water that we do take out. And I would suggest that one place to look for more value is urban wastewater. And so uh, this table, uh, prepared by my colleague and collaborator, Craig Criddle, uh, we attempted to see if we could identify the total value in a unit volume of typical urban wastewater. Now this is general for the US, we use some average values, but what you can see there is for a cubic meter of, of wastewater, uh, we tried to put a dollar value on what's there. And the, the rightmost, uh, your rightmost column is dollars per thousand gallons to give a, a unit that might be a little more visual. Uh, and so what we have identified is the highest value, of course, is the water. So the water in wastewater is a real resource of substantial value. In addition, there are nutrients that are fertilizers. And so there's value associated with that in wastewater. But the really exciting thing that we're rapidly learning much more about is that for relatively low cost, we can extract very high value from the organics in wastewater. And that's the part of wastewater you probably don't find very interesting. Um, but if you are uh, a bacteria, you find it really interesting. Uh, and it turns out by, by using ideas from material science and from biotechnology, we are learning how to uh, develop processes that extract that organic material and turn it into things of very, very substantial value. What that lets us do is to rethink how we manage wastewater. And I'd like to use a cartoon to illustrate that. So along the bottom here, we have our sewer. All right, with our wastewater flowing along, and off to the right there uh, is a wastewater treatment plant. On the uh, right-hand side, I've listed some different uses of water, all non-potable, uh, that require certain levels of quality in that water, and the, the level of quality required goes up as you go up that list. Now, suppose we had the ability to use these newer methods to extract carbon from the wastewater by doing something known as scalping. So in scalping, what we do is we take a portion of the water out, not all of it, we keep water flowing in the sewer, we take it out, and we extract the carbon from that. And by doing so, we create three value streams. We create water that's now available for some uses. And in fact, when you remove the carbon, you can use, do landscape irrigation with that water, for example. 
In addition, the carbon we've already seen has value. If we turn it into animal food, uh, it's worth actually a substantial amount. So we have the carbon, we have the water, and the more subtle one is that if we take the carbon out, and some of that carbon we can't use, what we do is we put it back in the sewer right, and let it go back down to the main treatment plant, and it turns out that's value added because we've concentrated the waste. And wastewater treatment plants are more efficient when the flow into them is more concentrated. So we have value with the treatment plant, we have value from the material we took out, and we have value in the water. We can keep doing this now. So, for example, we can take the water that we scalp the carbon out, and we can scalp the nutrients out of it. We can take the fertilizers out. We, if there's a market for the fertilizer, we sell the fertilizer. We now have higher value water that can be used for purposes that require uh, greater quality. And once again, we can concentrate the reject flow going to the treatment plant. We can continue that on, for example, and take salt out and get very high quality water, still non-potable, uh, but very high quality water that's worth more, uh, and we end up with the other products as well. And so one of the things that we're trying to do is to look at how the costs are going down and how we can engineer treatment methods that allow the scalping process to proceed. And what that does then is it allows us to really th rethink wastewater systems as systems. So, so traditionally, the little left-hand cartoon there, traditionally what we do is we build a single, large, efficient wastewater treatment plant at the lowest elevation in the community. We build a network of storm sewers. We collect all that wastewater. We deliver it by gravity to the treatment plant. It blends all the different wastewaters that are coming from different locations. Uh, we treat it. If we have somebody who would like to use some of that recovered water, we then have to deliver that water back up into the community, and that almost all always means that we have to pump it back up. So we have a substantial energy cost to, re -deliver, to deliver the water uh, after we've treated. If we can scalp, right, that allows us to overlay on the central system smaller, low footprint facilities that can extract value on a local scale. So we can disaggregate the system, we can decentralize, and our current research suggests that we can add substantial value by doing so. So the notion would be in the middle there is that we would go into a neighborhood right, and lay over the system so we don't change the existing pipes, we lay on it a scalping facility, we can tailor that to the particular wastewater and we can tailor it to the particular potential use in that location, and we can deliver it with low energy. And in fact, if we're really clever, we can treat here and deliver here and deliver here and deliver here and use gravity almost the entire way. So there's substantial value added by rethinking how we treat wastewater, reassessing the value in that wastewater. It allows us to get more value, uh, more dollars per drop of water that we take out, it allows us to reduce the amount we take out, uh, and it uh, puts us onto uh, a system where we, will, we can be more flexible with regard to growth. So we're very excited about what we've been learning at this, and I'm happy to report that right now on campus, a facility is being constructed at pilot scale to test some of these scalping uh, operations, and I'm hoping that Stanford will actually be the first university to implement a decentralized, disaggregated wastewater treatment system. So from my point of view, this is a great thing to be thinking about during our two-year window of opportunity. Thank you.